Derek Chauvin trial still moving forward. We're on day 22 now. The government introduced two new witnesses today, and most of those, actually I think all of them, both of them, were questioned today by Jerry Blackwell. So we're going to go over to our trial board, and we're going to see that Mr. Blackwell is up over here. And so he did the questioning today. He sort of uh, had, a, had, had the full responsibility today, and there were uh, it was a, a short day. The judge dismissed everybody relatively early, given the fact that they had kind of a grueling week with a lot of testimony, a lot of witnesses. So we just had two expert witnesses today, and it was these two individuals. You're going to notice that our witness board is filling up here quite quickly. And so we had a pathologist today who came in and talked about one version of George Floyd's death. Then we have Dr. Baker who came in, and he actually conducted the autopsy. And so we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about these two people. And so we're going to start with the pathologist first. Her name is Dr. Lindsay Thomas, this woman here, very pleasant woman, and she is a forensic pathologist. And so she's going to tell us a little bit more about her involvement and really specifically what she's being brought into in to do is to just be another expert witness. Remember, this all comes down to causation. What caused George Floyd's death? Was it asphyxiation? Was it low oxygen? Was it a heart attack? Was it a drug overdose? Was it something else? We don't know. We're trying to get to the bottom of that. So the government is trying to say that this is Derek Chauvin's knee on the neck that caused low oxygen, low, asphyx uh, low oxygen, which resulted in asphyxiation, essentially. Heart shut down, brain shut down, his life expired as a direct result of the low oxygen. And we've gone through this all week. You step back, step back out a little bit from that. Well, what caused the low oxygen? Well, it was the short and shallow breathing, said Dr. Tobin. Well, what caused the short and shallow breathing? Well, it was Derek Chauvin having both knees on his neck. And we went through and we saw some very, very compelling graphics and, you know, a, a, a knee on the neck, a knee on the back, kind of moving around. And Dr. Tobin was saying that this is very clear. You look at the body weight, you look at the physics on how Derek Chauvin was positioning himself. That leads you to easily conclude that there was too much weight on his back, on his neck that resulted in the short and shallow breaths, which then resulted in the low oxygen, which caused him to die. And so this doctor is coming in and she is explaining what we see on the death certificate. So why do we need her to explain it? Well, because she's got kind of an interpretation, right? She's going to come in here and explain what the cause of death was. And we're going to see Dr. Andrew Baker comes in and he has his version of the cause of death. So here is Dr. Lindsay Thomas. And she's, listen, I want you to pay close attention here. Because what we're going to see as this continues to unfold, the government has a lot of different witnesses, a lot of different experts coming in and testifying about why they believe George Floyd died. What caused it? They better all be in lockstep, right? It better be pretty unequivocal that they know and they are in agreement about what killed George Floyd. So this is why it's so important to understand and boil down what are they saying? What is it specifically that they're pointing to that was the, the cause? And here she is. She's going to start to detail that for us. And listen about what she says. Listen to about low oxygen, asphyxia. We have two clips from Dr. Thomas. And she's also going to talk about seeing the video and how she processed this whole thing. So this is our first witness today. A lot of testimony. We just clipped out some little, little bits here and there so that we're not you know, trying to squeeze six hours of content in here. But here is Dr. Thomas in court this morning. So if you put all this together, cardiopulmonary arrest, complicating law enforcement subdual, restraint and neck compression. What does that mean? Well, what it means to me is that the activities of the law enforcement officers resulted in Mr. Floyd's death, and that specifically those activities were the subdual, the restraint, and the uh, neck compression. Okay, and does this then also represent your own conclusion? Yes. Uh, a, a conclusion you have reached and an opinion you hold to a reasonable degree of medical certainty? Yes. Uh, would you tell us what you reviewed in order to reach this conclusion? Um, all of those things that I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the, again, what's sort of unique about this case is that often um, I would just review the medical examiner case file and that would provide information about what the cause and manner of death is. Um, but in this case, the autopsy itself didn't tell me the cause and manner of death. And it really required getting all of this other additional information, specifically the video evidence of the terminal mm. events, to conclude the cause of death and manner of death. All right. So she's basically trying to explain here what, what, what was the cause of death. So you, you heard Mr. Blackwell come out and say, well, 
it was cardiopulmonary arrest, complicating, subdual by law enforcement, neck compression, restraint, all that stuff. What does that mean? Well, it means that the officers killed him essentially, right? It, it was, it was, they were, they were compressing him. And how did she get that information? Well, she looked at everything, looked at all the same things that you and I looked at. And that's kind of the problem, isn't it? Right? We wanted a medical expert here weighing in on the physiological condition as to the cause of death. Now she's watching a video that everybody else is watching. And the, 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 the real issue here is the interpretation of that video. People are interpreting it in different ways. This is kind of what the crux of this trial is about. And it's even come up in the defense. They're saying, no, it wasn't on the neck. The knee wasn't on the neck. It was on the neck, shoulder, blade, across the back. And even the prosecution itself is sort of moving the goalpost a little bit, saying the neck area. Notice how that's happening now. It's not just the neck. It's now the neck area. And I think uh, uh, law of self-defense is where I saw that on Twitter. So go give them a follow. I think the attorney name over there is uh, uh, Branca, attorney Branca. And so he's posted over at legal insurrection and he noticed that he said yeah notice how they're using the phrasing is changing a little bit it's going from the neck to the neck area so the goalposts are moving a little bit and dr thompson is now coming in and saying i watched the video too in fact i had to watch the video as part of my analysis i really couldn't come to a conclusion but for the video and so she's watching the same thing the rest of us are watching and all we're all scratching our heads going yeah we know what the video told us we want to know what you say as a medical examiner what in your professional opinion is the ultimate cause and in this next clip she's going to say the the cause of death was the the officer's subdual complicating neck restraint all of that language but what is the manner of death so we know that according to her she's saying that it was a bunch of officers on the back of george floyd's neck that caused the death. If they were not there, he would not have died. But because they were on his back, what was the manner of the death? So how did the body stop working? And so this is what she says. Now, this is very important. What is the primary mechanism? What went wrong in the body? What systems failed that caused death? Because her opinion is going to be a little bit different than Dr. Baker's. So here is Dr. Lindsay Thomas telling us what killed Floyd. So, so focusing in on the mechanism of death here, uh, how is it that the officers of dual restraint and neck compression caused Mr. Floyd's death? So, as I mentioned, I think the primary mechanism was asphyxia or low oxygen. And it basically is Mr. Floyd was in a position uh, because of the subdual restraint and compression where he was unable to get enough oxygen in. Um, to maintain his body functions. Okay, you heard it. Primary mechanism, low oxygen, asphyxia, not able to get enough oxygen in. Oxygen, oxygenation was the cause of death, according to doc Dr. Thomas. So now we have to talk about different witnesses. Well, not yet. We got some cross-examination. I almost forgot. How can we move on without any cross-examination? So this is Nelson. Now Nelson comes in and we start to hear some interesting uh interesting theories about that the the fentanyl concentration and the methamphetamine concentration so what dr nelson is going to tell us and remember this yesterday just to catch you up if you missed yesterday but they were talking about a, a toxicology and the toxicology report they brought on a different doctor and the doctor was running them through what his crime lab had observed relative to people who were driving under the influence of either fentanyl or methamphetamines saying yes we've monitored we've done all of these different tests 2000 tests here 2500 tests here here's what we find there is about a third or a fourth of the population that can drive a car and be charged with the DUI at 11 nanograms per milliliter of fentanyl. We saw a pie chart. There was about, I think, uh, about half the people who get charged with fentanyl and driving are under 11 nanograms. About a quarter of them are right in that area, and about another quarter of them are way higher than that. Even people can be driving somewhere as high as 50 nanograms per milliliter. And the toxicologist was like, yeah, that's amazing. And so what they were trying to do, the government, is put Floyd's fentanyl concentration in context. They wanted to say, yeah, it was 11. Yeah, that might sound high, but other people can drive. And look, there are there's even data to support this. In fact, a lot of people can drive higher than that level. And people can also drive significantly lower than that level. But just because it's 11 doesn't mean that you just drop dead. We are hearing this phrase all over the place that 11 nanograms per milliliter is three times the lethal limit. It'll kill a horse, right? People are sort of memeing on Twitter. And so what they're trying to do is say, oh, no, that's not true at all. You can, in fact, you can drive a car up to 50 nanograms per milliliter if you are somebody who's a serious addict. So they're just trying to sort of wrap some bubble wrap around the drug and the fentanyl toxicity levels in Floyd's blood. And so what Nelson is doing now is he's coming out and he's saying, yeah, but 
you drew the blood. Well, he has, he's not saying this, but we can see where he's going. He's actually asking her specifically. You can, you can imagine that the defense is going to really flesh this out, but he's asking her specifically about fentanyl. And he's saying, hey, somebody has a heart attack or they're injured and they're rushed to the hospital. One of the first things they're going to do is they're going to pump them full of saline, right? They're going to uh, uh, give them fluids so that they can start to address and tr give them treatment. One of the first things they'll do is hook you up to a bunch of saline bags. And so if you if that happens, you are getting a bunch of fluids pumped into you and necessarily that's going to reduce the concentration of the drug toxicity in your body. You already have one level, you fill it with a bunch of stuff, it's going to dilute the concentration of the drugs. And here he is asking her about that. She's, she, she, she talks a lot about drugs and she actually says in here that there really is no known safe level of methamphetamine. So he gets her to acknowledge that, although that's not in this clip, I don't believe. So here she is talking about, yes, saline might actually result in a lower concentration. So the defense I think is gonna be a little bit of foreshadowing here that Nelson's defense is gonna say, yeah, it was 11 nanograms maybe, but could have been way higher than that because it was diluted when George Floyd was, was pumped full of saline by the time he got back to the hospital. So here is that clip. In a, in a case where you have a um, person who is uh, experiencing uh, cardiac arrest, right? And they're put in an ambulance and taken to the hospital for resuscitation. Uh, there often, uh, there's IVs that are placed in a person, right? Yes. And those IVs contain saline. Yes. And saline can ultimately dilute or decrease to some degree the amount of controlled substances that would be met as they would be measured. <clears throat> That's a theoretical possibility. You would agree that, that fentanyl is a respiratory depressant, right? Yes. It slows breathing and lowers oxygen in the blood. It, yes. Does the fact that there's norfentanyl in his blood mean that he took it some time ago? It, yes, but by some time, that's that's a very vague, yeah. So long enough in the past to start metabolizing. Exactly, exactly. But does it exclude him taking fentanyl more acutely or more recently in time? Um, no, there's no way really of knowing the timing. All right. So Nelson's doing a very nice job of cleaning up some of the uh, preceding days witnesses bombs that got dropped yesterday. Hey, he's saying, yep, you know, we, we saw a lot of charts and graphs yesterday. We saw the specific ratio yesterday of the fentanyl to norfentanyl. Basically, the government was trying to imply that because the ratio existed as a certain way, that that means that he couldn't have had the last minute ingestion. They didn't say that, but that's where they're going with that. So she comes out. This is the government's own witness. Basically, telling that ah, that's kind of not how that works, right? There are other possibilities that, or there are other ways I should be say, I should be fair to say that you can interpret some of the presentation that the government made yesterday. Next up then what Nelson does is he, he he's basically sort of backing out the different variables on the death certificate, which this woman is explaining is a number of different factors that could have related to George Floyd's death. And we don't know yet because we haven't heard from Dr. Baker. Dr. Baker is the person who drafted that and he's coming up next. So this woman is explaining some of it. And what Nelson is trying to do is sort of back out some of the other variables there and saying, listen, yes, we know that this involved a bunch of stuff, right? Pre COVID, he had officers on his back. No question about that. He had heart disease. He had methamphetamines in his system. He had fentanyl in his system. So all of it's messy. It's all, it's all jumbled up, so we can't make sense of it. So let's just back this out then. Let's just take all of the other variables out, and let's just pick one of those factors. Just pick one, and let's see. If you saw this one factor, would that alone be enough to convince you that that was sufficient to cause death in, in this hypothetical situation? Asks her that, and he does it here on fentanyl and the meth question. He kind of walks her through that analysis on different areas, but here is just fentanyl and meth, and here's what she says. And just kind of taking into consideration removing certain variables, right? You find a person at, at home, no struggle with the police, right? Um, and you, the person doesn't have a heart problem, but you find fentanyl and methamphetamine in this person's system at the levels that they are at, would you certify this as an overdose? 
again, in the absence of any of these other realities, um, yes, I could consider that to be an overdose. And the level of fentanyl in a person, um, again, in this hypothetical scenario, um, there are deaths certified as drug overdoses significantly lower than 11 nanograms per milliliter. Lower, higher, it's it's got a huge range, yes. As low, I believe, as 3% or 3 nanograms per milliliter. Yes. Right? So the ingestion of drugs is unique to that individual's body, right? Right. All right, so once again, dismantling a lot of what we saw yesterday. So it doesn't matter if some person or a good portion of the population can in fact drive a car at higher than 11 nanograms per milliliter because it's it's irrelevant. It's just sort of independent of any pattern. Fentanyl can impact people differently and different levels and different quantities can impact people dramatically differently. This is why we hear people all the time who thought they took something and you know half the half the group dies of fentanyl, the other half you know, doesn't die or, the, or there's a bad batch and a bunch of people drop dead. It's because it's a dangerous molecule and it's being manufactured on the black market. Nobody knows where it's coming from. It's all being imported probably from China and other places around the world. It's a huge problematic drug. And so that some of the data is still out on it. But she says specifically, if I was presented with a situation where somebody died and the toxicology report came back, 11 nanograms of fentanyl and remnants of methamphetamines and other drugs. Yes, that alone is sufficient to justify the cause of death. And so when you combine this with her question or her explanation about how she was reviewing this case, she said very clearly that she watched the videos, right? I had all this information. And if you watch the rest of her testimony, she does in fact kind of go into detail about this, saying ordinarily, I don't get to look at any of this stuff. I just get to look at the, you know, the, the, the medical examiner's report or the death certificate or whatever and make my judgment on that basis. And so my question would be, well, if that is would have been how she approach this case, would her conclusion have differed than if she had watched the video? Because for me, what it sounds like is she had enough information to conclude that fentanyl in and of itself alone, without any contributing factors would have killed him. And she could have come to that conclusion, but after she watched the video, she layered on the officer's physicality on top of other factors and then gave that the highest priority in terms of her conclusion. Now, I, you know, I would have liked to some, some inquiry on that, but it doesn't really matter because here's what's happening. We're seeing that the government is now sort of bringing out witness after witness. I think we're at three at this point. We had the doctor, uh, Dr. Tobin. We had the toxicologist and we had uh, actually we had the ER doctor, too, who talked about some of the breathing yesterday. And then we have this this woman. We have Dr. Thompson. And so now we're going to change gears a little bit. We're going to talk about Dr. Baker, who is the author of the, uh, the death certificate, and he also conducted the autopsy. So he walks us through everything that he did and the whole process, and we're going to explain that. But before I do, I want to show you about Rule 615. So this is Rule 615 about excluding witnesses from the federal rules of evidence. And I want to just show you this. So let, me, let me frame this out a little bit before we read the rule. There's a concept called the exclusion of witnesses. So this means that if you have other witnesses who are testifying, you kind of want to keep them separate and apart from one another. Typically with expert witnesses, this doesn't apply uh, or, or it can not apply. There, there's special rules for expert witnesses. But, but typically I want to just sort of frame this out, right? What we're seeing right now is we have different witnesses from this trial being brought into court and they're testifying in one manner, way, shape or form, right? They're coming into court and they're explaining their opinions. And one of the things that the defense wants to do is make sure that you're getting your own independent recount, your own independent interpretation of what a, a, a particular witness believes. And so there's a rule that says that you can exclude witnesses from hearing what the other witnesses say. Right now, expert witnesses are a little bit different because they're experts and, and sometimes they have to be responding to each other and they need to hear, hear from each other. So this doesn't necessarily apply here, but I just want to frame this out just so you understand this in context because we have not talked about this rule. 615 says that you can exclude other people from hearing what other people say. The reason why is because you don't want collusion. You don't want people to go, oh, I heard what that person said, so I'm just going to match his story. And then somebody else hears that, and they're going to match his story. And so right now we're talking about different witnesses that have different opinions, different things that they're saying. And I'm not sure if they're listening to each other or not. 
right? I'm not sure if Dr. Baker was sitting there listening to Dr. Thompson or if any of them listened to what Dr. Tobin said or what the ER doctor said or what the toxicologist said. I don't know. Right. And, and neither, neither do you, as far as, as far as I can tell, I'm not sure that anybody really knows except them. But when you do that, when you have witnesses that are excluded from each other, that's great because you're going to have independent stories. They're not going to be improperly biased by other witnesses. And so what happens is when you start to bring in a number of different expert witnesses with differing opinions, you're going to notice that their stories just don't match up. The stories don't align themselves perfectly. Right. And so we do this with police officers in regular misdemeanor cases, and you can see how it applies here. So the exclusion rule, before I get into it, says a party who is a natural person, I'm sorry, at a party's request, the court must order witnesses excluded so that they cannot hear other witnesses' testimony. Or the court may do so on its own, but this rule does not authorize excluding any party who is not a natural person, any officer, an officer, an employee of the party who's not a natural person a person whose presence a party shows to be essential to presenting the party's claim or defense. So like if you wanted to bring in an expert witness to refute another expert witness, they obviously got to hear what they talk about. A person authorized by statute to be present. And here is a, a, a notice of the advisory committee. It says the efficacy of excluding or sequestering witnesses has long been recognized as a means of discouraging and exposing fabrication, inaccuracy, and collusion. The authority of the judge is admitted. The only question being whether that matter is committed to his discretion or one of right, the rule takes a latter position. All right. So this is saying that it, that it, it can be appropriate to seclude people so that they're not colluding. They're not improper, uh, improperly biasing one another. And so police do this all the time, right? When they show up to the scene of a crime, they separate all the witnesses into different rooms. Then they ask them all questions. Then they go back and they say, well, what did he say? What did he say? What did he say? And they, they, they match them all up. So the same type of thing is happening here. Right. Whether it's expert witnesses or whether what the rules are, it really doesn't matter. People are being separated out. We're bringing them back in and we're comparing and contrasting their stories. And so we'll do this with police. Right. If, if an officer thinks that they properly identified our client and there were four different officers, we'll do independent interviews with each officer. We'll ask them if they've read the other officers reports. Sometimes they have. Sometimes they haven't. If they haven't, then what we'll do is we'll go through and we'll say, all right, well, describe our defendant. And he'll say, oh, he was six foot black, brown hair, blue eyes, whatever, right? Go to the next cop, 35, six foot seven, you know, uh, African-American brown eyes. All right, go to the next cop. Same thing, right? And they all are slightly off a little bit. And so now you'll notice that, well, their, their, their stories are off a little bit. These two guys said he was six foot. This guy over here said he was five nine. This guy said he had brown eyes. This guy said he had blue eyes. And you're, you're just comparing and contrasting the different witness testimony. Okay, so I spent way too much time explaining that and I did a poor job of it. But the point is, what we're seeing now is finally the culmination of this. We see that we have a pattern of witnesses who are being paraded into court. And we see that several of them have testified that Floyd died because of low oxygen and asphyxia. Three of them at this point have said that. And now we're going to hear from Dr. Baker and you got to listen what's missing. So this is Dr. Baker. Let's meet him. He is the guy who performed the autopsy. He walks us through everything he did. And he's actually, he was actually a very interesting person to listen to today. So he, he walked us through and he said, Hey, we cleaned up George Floyd's body. We you know washed everything very clearly. We took very, very good photographs. We took photographs before we cleaned them. Then we took photographs after we cleaned them. Then we, we extracted all the organs and performed an autopsy as autopsies or performed and they cut everything out all of the different organs they cut through the skin and they peel back the skin so they can look at any bruising that takes place underneath the skin and they're looking for uh, the heart even so he goes through this big long analysis of the heart and he says we, we cut the heart open we take it out we weigh it we measure it we you know we slice it open he details going in and taking little slivers off of the heart like at a you know, sandwich shop, these little slivers, you analyze them. And it's very fascinating on how he was explaining how they could identify some of the serious heart problems that George Floyd did have. So he walks us through that. He ultimately signed the, the death certificate and he walks us through it. So the government is just walking us through this and he describes what a homicide is. Right. Homicide. Many people think, oh, that's murder. Well, it's not really somebody died and there was another person involved in it. You know, could have been a factor, could have not have been a factor. And so they walk us through the five different categories on how to categorize this. And homicide felt like the best one. Other ones are accidents. Other ones are suicide and other ones, natural causes and things like that. So they categorize this as a homicide. This, it, of course, is the death certificate. And you can see here it was signed off on cause of death 
and we'll notice it says cardiopulmonary arrest, complicating law enforcement subdual, restraint, and neck compression. Underlying, nothing is here, okay, nothing in this little area. Then we have other contributing conditions, arteriosclerotic and hypertensive heart disease. We have fentanyl intoxication, and we have recent methamphetamine use. The manner of death was the homicide. So he's saying, yes, another person was involved in, in this and somebody died as a result of it, but this is not a legal term. Then he says, signed off on by Dr. Andrew Baker, Hennepin County Medical Examiner's Office, Chicago Avenue. Got it. So we really spend most of the time focused on this, on the explanation of this and this other contributing conditions. And so recall that Dr. Tobin and Dr. Thompson and the doctor, the other doctor, I think the ER doctor all said asphyxia, low oxygen. So here is Dr. Andrew Baker now being questioned by Prosecutor Blackwell, asking for his explanation about this. What does this mean? Tell us about this death certificate, because we don't know. Explain to the jury what you meant by that, because that's complicated language. Can't you just say he died of a heart attack? Can't you just say he was strangled to death? Can't you say he died of asphyxia? What does all this mean? Here is Mr. Blackwell. Now, in uh, Mr. Floyd's case, you listed the immediate cause of death as cardiopulmonary arrest, complicating law enforcement, subdual, restraint, and neck compression. Correct. What does cardiopulmonary arrest mean? That's really just fancy medical lingo for the heart and the lungs stopped. The heart, no pulse, no breathing. So with respect to the term uh, complicating, am I right in the understanding that this term uh, means occurring in the setting of? Yes. Or, or in other words, cardio cardiopulmonary arrest occurring in the setting of law enforcement, subdual restraint, and neck compression. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you, you, you flesh that out, right? So cardiopulmonary arrest, heart stops working, brain stops working, that's it, in, in layman's terms. All right, in the setting of what? Well, the law enforcement. There was physicality there in the setting of the neck, uh, uh, neck whatever the language he uses, right? It's very specific. So we need this guy to come in and tell us about it. So that's what he says. Now, in the next clip, he's going to talk about George Floyd's heart disease, and I want you to listen to this because we talked, we just sort of did the same thing. What was the cause of death with Dr. Thompson? She said it was asphyxia. What was, what, what the, the cause of death was the compression by the officers. The mechanism of death was asphyxia. So same question here. We just heard this from him. What was the cause of death? Cardiopulmonary arrest by complications from law enforcement. What was the mechanism of death? What was what happened? Dr. Thompson, Dr. Tobin, ER doctor, low oxygen and asphyxia. Let's listen to what Dr. Andrew Baker says. So Dr. Baker, can you tell us how it is uh, physiologically that the subdual restraint and neck compression uh, caused Mr. Floyd's death? In my opinion, the physiology of what was going on with Mr. Floyd on the evening of May 25th is You've already seen the photographs of his coronary arteries, so that you know you know he had very severe underlying heart disease. Um, I don't know that we specifically got to it, counselor, but Mr. Floyd also had what we call hypertensive heart disease, meaning his heart weighed more than it should. Um, so he has a heart that already needs more oxygen than a normal heart by virtue of its size, and it's limited in its ability to step up to provide more oxygen when there's demand because of the narrowing of his coronary arteries. Now, in the context of an altercation with other people that involves things like physical restraint, that involves things like being um, held to the ground, that involves things like the pain that you would incur from having your, you know, your cheek up against the asphalt, an, an abrasion on your shoulder, those events are going to cause stress hormones to pour out into your body, specifically things like adrenaline. And what that adrenaline is going to do is it's going to ask your heart to beat faster. It's going to ask your body for more oxygen so that you can get through that altercation. And in my opinion, the, the law enforcement subdual restraint and the neck compression was just more than Mr. Floyd could take by virtue of that, those heart conditions. By virtue of his heart conditions, it was more than he could take. That's the government's witness, right? That was Dr. Baker who signed off on the medical certificate, the heart essentially failed by virtue of his heart conditions, which as we know, he just quantified for us. He said very, very severe 
heart disease. Only one very, very severe heart disease. He also said he had hypertensive heart disease. And if you'll notice, he brought this up without the prosecutor asking about it. He says, hey, we didn't get into this, counselor, by the way. You're asking me for a conclusion, but we missed kind of a major part of this thing, which was hypertensive heart disease, meaning the heart actually weighed more than it should have. So a bigger heart, and he's got all these major heart problems. He didn't say anything about low oxygen or asphyxia. So now we have two government witnesses at odds with one another. Not really more than that. We got three versus one, which is a big deal. Okay, that is what we start to call reasonable doubt. We have a differing of opinions as to the cause of death, the mechanism of death, low oxygen or asphyxia, and pretty damning compelling testimony from the guy who invented lungs, wrote the book on mechanical ventilation, right? He saw what he saw the same way that a plumber finds a leak. You operate, you see what's in your wheelhouse. If somebody asked me about legal problems, the first thing I'm looking for, criminal legal problems, because that's what I know. This guy was looking for a problem, identified it as a ventilation problem, quantified it as low oxygen asphyxia. That was the cause of death. Backed up by the ER doc, backed up by Dr. Thompson. Now this guy, all government witnesses. Now this guy comes back out, Dr. Baker, doesn't mention any of that. Says it was really just low oxygen, not, not low oxygen, it was really just heart problems, severe heart disease and hypertension. So... Now, Mr. Nelson comes back out and Nelson is going to go into some questioning from cross-examination and he's asking him specifically about these other significant conditions. So remember when I showed you the death certificate, there was that complicated language there, cardi cardiopulmonary arrest, complicating law enforcement, subdual, neck compression, and so on. Beneath that, there was the other paragraph that said other significant causes. And so here's Nelson now asking him about those specifically, because we heard yesterday that they're trying to minimize a lot of these significant causes, right? Fentanyl couldn't have done it. We know people can drive. Methanol couldn't have done it. We know people can drive and on and on and on. So now Nelson is cross-examining Dr. Baker and asking him specifically about those conditions and whether they matter or not. And what is his opinion on that? And here he is. In any death investigation, you're trying to determine the cause and manner of death, right? Correct. And in this particular case, you obviously took into consideration the police restraint, right? Correct. But you also took into consideration the heart disease, correct? Yes. As well as the toxicology results, agreed? Yes. And you factored those in in your, uh, in your cause, there's the cause and manner of death, uh, and then there's the second thing that you left blank, right? And then there's the contributing causes or contributing factors. Yes, the, the term of art is other significant conditions is what you're getting at, Counselor. Yeah. And that's simply just something you have to do for the CDC, or did you take those into consideration as contributing to Mr. Floyd's cause of death? So when you put those on a death certificate as a physician, what you're saying is, I think these played some role in this death. They had a contributing condition. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm unaware of how the CDC would mandate what goes on there. Presumably the goal is you put things on there that you believe are relevant. You, you don't list tr trivial stuff on there that didn't play a role. And so if something was significant enough, uh, you put it on, but if it's insignificant and didn't contribute, you leave it off. Generally, yes. Okay. And so in your opinion, uh, both uh, the heart disease as well as the history of hypertension and the drug, uh, the drugs that were in his system played a role in Mr. Floyd's death? In my opinion, yes. All right. Right. That's the government's witness. In my opinion, yes, all of that stuff matters. Now, they come back out on rehabilitation, uh, you know, a redirect. And so, you know, they, they, they do what they can to clean that up. But it, it's this type of fundamental disagreement that is problematic. Right? It doesn't matter what they come out and clean up. It doesn't matter what they're able to sort of do here. You have a fundamental disagreement that happened you, today. First doctor said low oxygen asphyxia. This doctor comes out, now it was his heart. Heart failed. It's a pretty big, pretty big discrepancy there. And we'll see what the jury has to say about it. Now, this is uh, the next clip from Mr. Nelson, sort of you know, diving in on this, talking about the heart. Well, what about the arteries? And how does methamphetamine impact how the heart functions? Here is Dr. Baker. 
which uh, which of the arteries supplies the the uh, you, you, that first one, the SA node, the sino, the sinoatrial node. Right. I believe it's a small branch of the right coronary artery in most people. And is that the one that was ninety percent occluded? Not the branch. I didn't dissect out the branch, but yes, the the main right coronary artery was ninety percent narrowed. Um, you're aware also of the methamphetamine that was found in Mr. Floyd's system? Yes. Does methamphetamine further constrict the vessels and ventricles and arteries? I don't know. I'm not an expert in the specific toxicology of methamphetamine. It is certainly hard on your heart in the sense that it does things like drive up the heart rate and drive up blood pressure. I don't know if it's a vasoconstrictor, um, but in Either way, as a general rule for forensic pathology, methamphetamine is not good for a, a damaged heart, a heart with coronary artery disease. Does the amount of uh, the, or the level of the toxicological findings affect whether it's good for the heart or bad for the heart? I don't know that there's a scientific answer to that, Counselor, because I'm not aware that there's a quote unquote safe level of methamphetamine. Sure. And, um, yeah. And he goes on and he says, well, what about the, you know, the, the, the amphetamines that kids take or, you know, uh, even adults take, right, for ADHD, for uh, uh, attention deficit disorder and those types of things. And he says, well, yeah, that's a different thing. There, there's no safe level of the methamphetamine, which is the street drug and all of that. So arteries clogged. You just heard him, right? 90% on the main coronary artery on whatever side of the heart that was. And then on top of that, methamphetamines, he says there's no safe level of meth. So it's right, it, it's it's leading, I, I would guess, the juries to say, well, this, these are pretty, pretty, pretty significant contributors to the cause of death. And this is the guy that actually cut the heart open, was slicing it up, right, and was able to look inside and show the jurors pictures of the heart. Now, we didn't see it, but presumably they did. And they were able to see, he describes it, if you listen to the audio about, you see that stuff, that's what you don't want. That's why you don't smoke cigarettes and you eat well and your doctor checks your cholesterol. Otherwise, your heart vessels close 90%. Then you're getting in the middle of an altercation on the side of the road. You've got your adrenaline flowing. You've got some recent drug use. The rest is kind of history. The heart failed, not low oxygen and asphyxia which is directly contradictory to these other witnesses. And this is our last clip. Let me take a look here. What do we have? Uh, which of the arteries supplies the... So that was, we already got that one. So now let's talk about bruising. So, all right, so we've got a couple different things. So Nelson is asking him about, in this clip, bruising on the back. So he just sort of un un unrang the bell by contradicting with this expert the manner, the mechanism of death by reintroducing methamphetamine as a dangerous contributing factor by sort of pivoting, pivoting this away from low oxygen and asphyxia back towards the heart failed, right? We're doubling down on that. Then he's going to say, well, what about some of the physicality that other expert witnesses are claiming caused this high pressure on the back of Floyd caused by Derek Chauvin? Remember, we saw some of that. We saw Dr. Tobin come in and give us some charts, give us some graphics, detail the physics, of the human body show, you know, the levers and the pressure points and show the weight coming down upon a person. So now we're talking about that. Now we're not talking about drugs. We're not talking about low oxygen or asphyxia. We're talking about, well, if there was so much pressure on the back of George Floyd, wouldn't you expect to see some evidence of that? This guy did the autopsy. I explained to you that he was cutting open the skin and sort of pulling some of it back. So you could see if there were any bruising or burst capillaries or however they identify that under the skin, subcutaneous, as, as he said, and they are, he's asking him about this. So if all that pressure was on Floyd's back, did you see any of that? When you analyze that, what did you see? And it's sort of an awkward conversation that's happening here, but you get that good part at the very end where they're talking about, well, we just don't see asphyxia when there's pressure on the back of your neck. And again, this is contradictory to what Dr. Tobin said. Very, very different testimony, competing expert witnesses on the same side of the case, which is not so good for the prosecution. And in terms of, you know, when you think about just kind of the classic strangulation, I'm taking my fingers and I'm, my hands and I'm applying pressure to your neck, even those small fingers, you, you would expect to see bruises consistent with the size of my fingers, right? 
Again, in my line of work, we more often than not see bruises. Um, you did say consistent with the size of your fingers. That might be true on television shows, but in the real world, there's not a lot of correlation between the size of bruises we see and the size of assailants' hands. But we are looking for those telltale bruises. All right. And in terms of in this particular case, uh, you, the the knee, the placement of the knee being a pretty bony, hard, round object, right? Um, yeah. I mean, it's it's pretty concentrated right under the kneecap, the force. Right. And of course, the shin bone is just below the skin, right? Yes. And it's sort of triangular in its nature, right? On cross section, yes. And so if a substantial amount of force was being used by the knee or the shin bone on the neck or back area in your line of work, and if that force was sufficient to uh, asphyxiate him, would that, would you expect to see bruising? I would expect to see bruising, but I don't know that the lack of bruising excludes that. We, you, you and I kind of just pivoted from strangulation, which is really pressure to the front of the neck, to the pressure of the back of the neck. And it, that's just not something that I think we see as medical examiners, pressure to the back of the neck explaining a strangulation. Uh, or an asphyxiation. Correct. Right, so the pressure to the back of the neck, not something you see in strangulation cases, of course, or asphyxia cases. So. Uh, directly contradicting what Dr. Tobin said about all of the pressure, all of the weight coming down to bear on his back. Now, the government easily, I think, can sort of push this higher up the chain a little bit. So their counter to all of this would be, well, it doesn't really matter what the mechanism of death was because both of those were triggered by Derek Chauvin, right? So sort of you're, you're going up the chain of causation a little bit. What was the superseding cause? What happened before that? So we know that Floyd died, could have either been from low oxygen, could have been a heart failure. We know it wasn't a drug overdose, though, is what they're going to say, because that would lead to some culpability, some responsibility for that overdose going back over to Floyd. So they need to connect the cause, the manner, the mechanism of death back to something that Chauvin did. So if Chauvin lead, leaned on the back or the neck or the neck area or however the government wants to call it, and that resulted in low oxygen, fine. If it was the result, the result of the leaning or the kneeing was the heart failing, it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter because the ultimate perpetrator, the ultimate original cause was Derek Chauvin. So they may have to try that angle. All right. Anyways, let's take a look at some questions over from watchingthewatchers.locals.com. If you want to ask a question, that's the best place to do it. So Jay Bone in the house says, I think after the testimony today by the medical examiners, particular Dr. Baker, the prosecution's case rests squarely on the testimony of Dr. Tobin. I look forward to seeing how the defense puts together its case in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, it will be very interesting. I mean, I, basically at this point, what you can do is just sort of make a chart. This doctor... This doctor, this doctor, this doctor, this doctor, cause of death, mechanism of death. List all those out. See what's in there. You're going to see one of these things just doesn't belong here. One of these things is not like the others. And Dr. Baker is going to be that person. So we have Big Jono says early on after the arrest, Chauvin's wife divorced him. Do you think this was a way for them to squirrel away assets and protect their against financial liabilities in the future? Have you seen this before? Um, I don't think so. You know, I don't really know. That's not my area of expertise, Big Jono. It's a good question, but that would be something for a family law attorney or somebody in that wheelhouse. I don't, I, I pro probably not, right? She's probably just as tired of this whole thing as everybody else. And this was a good justification to just get away from the blast zone. That is the Derek Chauvin trial. Good to see you though, John. We got Baldman says, I've heard some legal experts question how some of the expert testimony from yesterday wasn't allowed to get in, that some of it was speculative. Not sure if I'm remembering correctly. What are your thoughts on the nature of the legality of some of these expert testimonies? Yeah, so, you know, a lot of this stuff was fleshed out prior to the trial starting. There are what are called motions in limine, and we fleshed a lot of this stuff back out. I know a lot of people are sort of coming to this trial now because this is the interesting stuff, but a lot of this stuff was fleshed out before the trial, uh, even during jury selection. So remember, there was about two weeks of jury selection before the trial even got underway, before it even started. And so a lot of these issues about what the experts can say and what they can't say, a lot of this was fleshed out before the trial even started. So when you're hearing these objections come up in court, it's kind of the judge's 
is operating around the margins. And so you've seen this come out, right? Some, some people can't, they can't testify about things that are overly spec speculative. So they can't sort of guess about what happened in the future, but they can play around with hypotheticals. And that's what they're doing, right? Nelson comes out and says, hypothetically. But he can't say, if George Floyd would have done this, then, then what? Because it's almost, it's too personal. There's a lot of reasons why they are being very careful about what the experts can say, because you don't want them to spill over and talk about something that they have no expertise in. So they flesh out a lot of these rules, and really the judge is just implementing them. But it's a good question. We're going to see a lot more of it, obviously. Matty Jones says, I actually tried the experiment with scales last week and how easy and how it is and how easy it is to manipulate where the weight is distributed. Do you think it's possible they do this in court? I don't think so. I'm not, I don't think that we're going to, you know, I don't know. It's a good question, Maddie. And so Maddie's talking about sort of an idea I shared on the show last night about getting two scales, putting some pillows down or whatever, and just adjusting your weight. I mean, you can, you can, you can feel that if you just move a little bit, you can almost fall over because your center of gravity is off. And I've done a lot of wrestling and mixed martial arts. I know how to maneuver my body around. And so I know that with little maneuvers, if you have somebody in the right leverage or in the right points, you can just make some minor adjustments. That person can go from conscience awake to not awake anymore, just with a whip, whip, little squeeze there. And that's it. So you can, you can maneuver your body. Obviously, Maddie Jones tried it. I still don't think we're going to see it in court just because it's a little bit too provocative. It's, it's, it's a little, it's, I, I don't think that either side would want to, to, to try it because it could go, it could go bad in so many ways. I think it's, I, I, I'm not sure that it's the right move for a lot of reasons, but we'll see. Maybe it comes in. I don't know. Spoil up says just a general question. Have you ever heard of attorneys using illegal means, tapping phones, hacking computers, to monitor jurors' activities. Would you be surprised to find out it is happening in a high-profile case such as this? Would having that information be worth the risk of obtaining it? Good question, Spoila. So I have not specifically, well, I so I've read about it, right? I've read about attorneys doing improper things with jurors. That happens all the time. And judges have to correct that. Now, in a case like this, you know, I'm not sure how, how, uh, how intense it would get, but it would not surprise me. And in fact, I was thinking about this yesterday. I was thinking about when Eric Nelson was going through his line of questioning about how he was missing kind of a major issue that we talked about on the show yesterday. And so I was wondering, is somebody monitoring Twitter? Are they crowdsourcing some of the public comments? Because I posted a tweet. I'm not saying I had anything to do with this. I, I'm, not, I'm not going down that road. But I did post a tweet and I said, hey, when you were questioning Dr. Tobin, George Floyd was complaining about breathing problems before there was any of the four criteria on. Actually, there was one. He was in handcuffs. But Dr. Tobin came out. He gave us four criteria. There was a point in time during the video where Floyd was complaining about breathing and only one of those four factors was in play. He had his handcuffs on. So why was he complaining about breathing when there was nobody on his back? And we'll notice that Eric Nelson asked that question of the next witness. So maybe somebody is monitoring Twitter or getting in, you know, maybe somebody from his office was watching and just said, hey, hello, what are you doing over there? Ask this question. He came back out and asked it. So a uh, good question. I, I think that it, it, it is absolutely something that would be worth monitoring to see whether this is inappropriate, right? The judge probably has had this conversation maybe off the record with these attorneys because you don't want people to get overly aggressive with the jurors, right? They're, these are people, these are private citizens, they're doing their civic duty and you wanna make sure that they're not being harassed in any way, shape or form so that you can protect the integrity of the judicial process. Good question. Next up, we got Ma Fox says, is it common for attorneys to hire PIs to look into jurors? I don't think that that's common. I mean, I think that, you know, a PI is sort of has that negative connotation where, you know, it's like somebody going to your house, somebody's following you to your kid's school, something like that. And I'm not sure that that, that happens, but there are, yeah, attorneys all the time use jury consultants. There's jury coaches. There's, there's all, there's a whole segment of practicing law that is just focused on jurors. I mean, you have all sorts of people who are experts on that. And so that's a different, but that's a sort of a different angle. That's a different approach. PIs, they're really aggressive and almost, you know, almost abusive in some people's understanding of them. And, I, and you know, we, we use personal or private investigators for other things, but typically not for jurors. 
they usually go back and recreate the scene of the accident, or go take measurements or do a background check or somebody go investigate in those in those ways, witnesses and people of that variety, but not jurors, right? Jurors are sort of innocent bystanders who are part of this. Now, if you can find stuff about them on social media, stuff that they posted publicly, that is obviously something that needs to be done. And it was done here in this particular case. Good question there though, Ma Fox. All right, and so those questions came over from watching the watchers dot locals dot com. And if you want to ask a question, that's the best place to do it. And you can also support the show. We appreciate that. So watching the watchers dot locals dot com.